Right, evening everyone. So many people. Cool. Right, so I'm Johnny. Uh, I work here at AO as well uh, as a business intelligence developer. Um, quick show of hands, who knows what business intelligence is? Awesome. So many people up there. Uh, so effectively, uh, my day job, uh, we take um, data from various business systems and organize that um, into uh, usable formats for people to be able to analyze. Uh, that can be in the form of providing data sets to analysts so they can interrogate it. Or we might be uh, producing operational reports and things like dashboards. So data visualization is very much part of my day job um, and something that I personally have been quite um, excited to sort of research myself in my, in, uh, in my spare time in the meantime. Uh, I'm going to try and make this quite an interactive talk. So I'm going to be throwing out some questions into the audience. Please don't be shy. Please shout out your answers. Um, if there's any uh, questions as well, don't worry about interrupting me. Just shout out, interrupt, and uh, we'll do the rest to answer. So again, in the spirit of that, quick show of hands so I get an idea of who I'm presenting to. Who here works in IT? Cool. Most people who doesn't work in IT. Cool. Okay, look. So, out of the people who do work in IT, um, who's a developer? Who's writing code day by day? And who's maybe doing sort of um, administrative work in the background, maybe uh, project management or business analysis? Cool. Good mixture. So, the very first Northwest Tech Talk, and um, this isn't a very techy talk. Um, if you are a front end developer, um, and maybe you're presenting some data in an application, and hopefully there's going to be some takeaways for you. If you're in a non-technical role, um, again, the techniques and advice I'm going to give will hopefully apply to you too. So if you're writing something in Java for argument's sake, or if you're crunching numbers in Excel or putting something in PowerPoint, hopefully there's still going to be something you can take away from this. So why is data visualization important? So we live in an increasingly data-driven world. Um, business intelligence as a discipline sort of emerged sort of Ran about the mid-90s and has carried on through, and, and more recently you've got uh, the likes of data science as well. Businesses want to make data-driven decisions. They want um, to do sort of evidence-based management rather than making decisions based on gut instinct. It's more about looking at the data. So communicating that data effectively becomes really, really important to make sure that the decisions that we are making become effective. The worst thing that could happen is to have the greatest data in the world but you present it to your stakeholders and they misinterpret what it means and make a bad decision off the back of it. So this is a quote by a lady called Stephanie Evergreen. She's a, a data visualization consultant, writes a really, really good blog. Uh, I'll not read it out to you. I'll just give you sort of a few seconds to take that in. But what she's getting out there for me is that effective data visualization gives you the opportunity to have the edge over you, um, your opponents and your competitors and things like that. If you can do data visualization you can really, really well, you can make sure that you are making these decisions quicker and get into market faster and, and things like this and, and really give you that advantage. A few key principles we're going to cover. So uh, Edward Tufty, uh, I had to Google how to say it, it is Tufty. Uh, he wrote a book back in 1983, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information really snappy title. Um, he coined this phrase data ink ratio. So he basically, um, his theory is basically the best way to communicate data is to keep your data to ink ratio sort of high to low. You want to be able to present as much data as possible using as little possible ink. Um, as I say, even though sort of the emergence of um, data driven decision making is relatively recent, some of the theory behind how to do it effectively is still pretty old, so that's 1983. Uh, data Looks Better Naked, that was a series of blogs by a guy called Joey Chedarchuk. I'm really glad that I quoted people with really easy to read names. Um, again, he's basically sort of saying there that, that keep your data visualization simple. Simple is effective. Less is more is kind of the same principle again. We're looking at function over form here, which effectively means that we're not trying to make things look pretty, we're trying to make them effective as data visualizations. So, a little disclaimer for us. Data in this presentation is fictitious, so don't see anything on here and think that, that it's real, uh, apart from one pie chart. Uh, any similarity to actual persons, <laughs> living or dead, is purely coincidence. So, 
I'm going to take us through some examples of data visualization and hopefully give some uh, hints and tips in terms of how we can make things a bit better. So tables, simplest form of data presentation you can think of. Can you really go wrong? There's probably not necessarily bad practices, but there's definitely things that we can do to make this better. So first thing I'm going to do with this, I'm going to change that font. We want plain typefaces when presenting data. Um, that means no serif. So when you get um, typefaces in things like Word and Excel, and something says sans serif, that means it doesn't have serifs. The serifs are things like the little ticks and squiggles and eccentricities in the typeface. Um, there's two key reasons for that. Uh, first of all, going back to the uh, data ink ratio, all those services use extra ink, so they don't fit into that principle. The other thing, um, I saw a really interesting documentary a few years ago about the invention of motorway signs. Now, that is more interesting than it sounds when I've said it out loud, but basically they talked about the fact that uh, if you look at motorway signs in the UK, it's, you're hurtling down the motorway at 70 miles per hour. It's a necessity that you need to be able to process information quickly. So the typeface used on motorway signs is deliberately very, very plain because they did a load of experimentation and found out that plain fonts can be processed quicker and understood easier. Um, a little extra on that, if you look at UK motorway signs, they're all in proper case, um, whereas on the other continent it's all capitals. Again, using proper case, it's loads easier to process the information because you're, um, there's basically there's more difference between the lower case and the upper case letters. So things like G's and P's, which sits below the line, H's and L's, which go up to the top, and um, the other letters that sort of sit in between. There's, because of more differentiation, it's easier for them to read it. So what am I going to do next? I'm going to change my column order. So what I'm going to do there is I'm going to start grouping together my data types. Uh, the convention for this is to have strings on the left, then dates, then your numbers and figures on, on the right. So you kind of group in there, the data on the right-hand side, and then the information about the data on the left. Again, kind of almost psychologically by sort of grouping those types of data types together, it just becomes easier to consume. Uh, next up, I'm going to align my text. Um, so a few things with this. Trying to create a bit more white space around those is almost like adding punctuation in a sentence. If you can imagine uh, a long paragraph, uh, if you leave out your punctuation, it becomes hard to understand. The punctuation here is about creating a bit more white space in between it, so we're making sure that we're getting uh, things that are uh, vertically aligned in the center. And again, we're differentiating, by, uh, differentiating the data types by left aligning our strings and then right aligning our dates and numbers. Next thing we're going to do, we're going to remove borders and separate headers, and we're going to use alternating row colors. So probably going to show my age here. But if you can remember looking through an old style, uh, an old style phone book, so the days before you just looked it up on Google, um, obviously a lot of data in that, and it was really easy to read potentially someone's name on the left, and then you lose which number corresponds to which name. So doing that just helps sort of, uh, when you're scanning rows of data, helps visually group them together and make sure that you associate the data on the left with the data on the right effectively. Oh. Uh, it also means that you're um, getting one of those columns, again, sort of breaks up the fact that you've disassociated the data. So you're reading it a row at a time, it encourages you to do that. Uh, last thing we need to do, uh, it's something called visual funneling. So visual funneling, what we're going to do is we're going to identify which data is most important and then use a little trick to make sure that we highlight that data. So if you can imagine for a second, if we remove the headers from that table, you'd probably still be able to figure out what it was about. It's probably still fairly obvious that it's uh, retail type data. Uh, whereas if you were to remove the data and left, leave the headers alone, then it would be nonsensical. So the actual data in the table is more important than the headers. So to emphasize that, lighten the font at the top. So basically it visually funnels into the most important information in the visualization. What you can do with this one is you can go a step further. So you can actually look at visually funneling to the numbers because if you're doing an analysis on sales data, it's probably going to be the revenue figures that are most important to you anyway. So tables, quick before and after. I wouldn't say the before is necessarily bad practice, but that after is a vast improvement, and there's some science applied to it that, that say that that's going to be uh, easier to consume and quicker to understand. 
Next up, column and bar charts. What do we think of this? Nice pretty bar chart. Good, isn't it? So first thing, what am I going to do with this? That 3D is terrible. This guy, Johnny, in the pink, what, what value is he? Someone shout out, what is he? Go on louder. 9.7. So, hang on, where are we going? This here lines up here with the 9.6, doesn't it? But actually that at the back is kind of, who knows? Is it 9.8, is it 9.6, who knows? The other thing being, um, for our um, tough these perspective and our data ink ratio, that 3D effect is just taking up more on ink. It's absolutely needless. So, 3D effects are the devil. Just say no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up. Who can tell me the significance of the fact that Rob's in blue and Ben's in purple? Who wants to have a guess? All right, it doesn't mean anything. If there's no reason to differentiate between the data series using colour, then don't bother. It's just another thing for your brain to have to process. Again, you might get some people who start looking into it and sort of think there's some kind of meaning hidden in that colour association. So I think I saw a graph once and the corporate colours for this particular brand were like red and green. And so everything was branded red and green. And then everyone was like, oh, well, red's bad and green's good. It was like, no, they were just randomly assigned colours. So if you don't need to... Um, Use excessive colour, don't do it. Right, I'm going to get experimental now for the next one. Who's feeling brave? Who fancies a bit of audience participation? Any show of hands? Anybody? <laughs> right, this isn't common. It's going to happen for our lovely assistant. Yay! Right, so. <laughs> The next slide I'm going to show you has got a data visualization on it. Okay. Take a look. It's a stacked column percentage chart. Does that mean anything about it? So a stacked column percentage chart, it's going to have one column, okay. and the column is going to stack two values on it. Now, the values on it are yes or no. So looking at it without thinking, just going on instinct, right. I want you to tell me which, what's the percentage of yeses and what's the percentage of noes. I know it needs to be lightning quick. Right. Don't think about it. What's the split? Are you ready? Hey, thank you. I was so glad that you got that wrong, because that's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it misleading to truncate the y-axis? And you look at that and you say, 50-50. Well, it's not, because uh, truncating the y-axis basically means changing your scale on the left-hand side of the visualisation, and that will distort the meaning of the results. So, thank you very much. You can take oh, a seat. Thanks. There we go. We're done. Yes. I'm so glad she got that wrong, because I was totally, like, unrehearsed. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so it, just, it distorts the result. Now, um, if you marketeers, anyone work in marketing? Ooh, so this is a marketing trick. So if you um, want to compare your product to uh, someone else's product, and you're going to say, oh, look how much better my product is than them, if you truncate the axis, you'll exaggerate the result. So to look at this again, First instance, who's the best BI developer? It's Johnny, obviously. <laughs> but the scale's been massively truncated. It only runs between 8.6 and 9.8. So if you actually apply the full scale on it, you look at it and sort of say, that tells a very different story. That says that actually um, this fictitious company <coughs> has got a wealth of BI talent and that everyone's sort of, you know, of, of a very high standard. <clears throat> <laughs> What I would say about this is, like, on the one hand, I'd, I'd call some K in the access bad practice, but sometimes you can't really avoid it. So we had uh, an ops manager that had uh, a load of charts, and I looked at one, and I was like, <gasps> some K in the access, oh, you can't do that, it's terrible news. Um, but he was looking at, like, really big figures, like the difference between 300 grand in revenue for a particular revenue stream and 301 grand to him made a massive difference. And to show that on a full scale, it looked the same. So there is... It has its time and place to truncate the axis, but make sure it's a conscious decision. Um, absolutely, there are some reporting applications, and Excel does it. It will truncate the axis for you just because it decides that that's what's best. Um, so watch out for it, and by all means, if you are going to truncate the axis, 
you can do it, but it needs to be a conscious decision. What I'd also try to do is make sure it's obvious. So I'll just go back a bit. The two dashes on that y-axis there indicate that that's a truncated axis. Um, people might not know that, so I'd probably be tempted to be a bit more explicit. Um, I'd either show two chart, charts side by side potentially, so one with a truncated axis, one without, uh, just for comparison. That kind of goes against the sort of less is more um, theme, so potentially just be explicit in your title that what you're showing is um, truncated or not. So we're well on our way to what I would describe as a best practice column chart at this stage. But I'm still going to need some other stuff to it. So let's think about the x-axis. We've talked about y-axis and truncating it. We're going to think about our x-axis now. So if it was a time series, it would just very naturally be chronological. You basically run your, your dates across the bottom. It's very obvious that that's um, the passing of time as it moves from left to right. Time series kind of sort themselves out. If you're doing small multiples, so small multiples is basically taking the same data series but comparing them across different categories. Um, when you do that, it's just about keeping it consistent. So alphabetical is probably a good one. Um, you might have certain lines of business that are deemed to be more important than others, so you might order it by that. Uh, that was just literally ordered by the ID, so it's like literally as the values appeared in the table. But as long as they're all, each one's kept in the same position for comparison. But if it's a one-off chart, uh, what I'd do is I'd just uh, order it by the values. So uh, if you're looking for the best BI developer, then order it left to right in terms of the highest value and the lowest value. So think about your y-axis order, x-axis order. Right. One more thing I'm going to do about this. Was a bar chart or a column chart really the best way? Is a bar chart better? So going back again to this example, I would say looking at that with a relatively small uh, data series, you draw onto the title at the top first, then your eyes go down to the bottom to find out the data series, and then they go back up to the top to try and figure out what the values are versus this, which basically you start at the top, and then your, your eyes almost work left to right as if you're reading words from a page. Um, that, for me, is a, just a more intuitive way of, of reading exactly the same data. Um, again, I wouldn't necessarily call that best practice per se. That's more sort of personal preference from my perspective. And again, from that, um, in that scenario, once you get passed around 10 or 12 data series and you start to get really, really long, it doesn't really work either, and you're probably better doing uh, the column chart. So, another quick before and after. That's what we started with the bottom, at uh, the top. That's what we end up with at the bottom. Once again, the one at the top is very pretty. It looks very, very nice. It may well be visually appealing. Possibly keep a picture next to your bed or something, I don't know. But the one at the bottom has got techniques applied to it, which mean that people should be able to process and understand the, better, uh, understand the data better and quicker. through the numbers, it's, it's the level of BI bestness. <laughs> <laughs> High is definitely better. <laughs> uh, line charts. So most of the same rules apply. So we want to uh, think about, uh, well, line charts, you nearly always got a time series on the, across the bottom anyway. Think about um, our uh, y-axis and making sure we don't truncate it. This is an instance where we do want to differentiate between color. So make sure there's enough contrast between our data series. So here at AO, we've got a wonderful uh, palette that was pulled together by our brand team. Uh, if you work somewhere where you don't have something like that, this is a really good resource, color.adobe.com. Uh, if you visit that website, what you can do um, is you can type in a color, and it will give you suggested um, contrasting palettes for you to be able to play with, and it gives you some <coughs> really nice, smart-looking charts. A uh, place I used to work, our brand palette had two colours. It had raspberry and sand. <laughs> and it had, it did have also dark raspberry and light raspberry, and it had dark sand and light sand. So I used colour.adobe.com to give me a nice, bright, uh, contrasting colour palette. Pie charts, okie doke. So is there anybody else in the audience who is a bit of a data viz geek like me? Cool, okay. I swear to God, I'm not the only one. So, uh, pie charts amongst sort of data viz enthusiasts and the data viz community are um, controversial. They're kind of like Brexit controversial. Um, 
And I could have probably just done the entire talk just about pie charts. But there's um, Joey Chedarchuk, if that's how you say his name, uh, on his blog, uh, Dark Horse Analytics, pulled together this really cool GIF. So I'll let you watch this. There we go. So I can't, can't take credit for that one. Uh, so Jerry Chedachuk, there's a lot of people who basically say don't use pie charts. Uh, Stephanie Evergreen, who I've already quoted, she put together uh, a Christmas package one year that had a one, uh, you get one pie chart per year package. It was like literally a card that you could play like it was Monopoly. She hates them as well. So why are they bad? Uh, the human brain is bad at judging size and wedges. So it was going to be a really great opportunity to live demonstrate this with actual pizza. Uh, and we've got Chinese food on the way, so we're not going to do that. <laughs> uh, but who, who's ever cut a pizza into perfectly equisized wedges? Just the human brain is just bad at doing it. So this is the real pie chart. Technically, it's a donut chart because it's a pie chart with a hole in the middle. Now, the guy who created this used to work for AO, and he's, he's since left. Um, it, it wasn't because of this pie chart. Uh, it possibly could have been, but. Um, I thought he was supposed to be here tonight, but I don't think he's turned up because that could have been really, really awkward. Um, but yeah, this, like, this slide could have just been when pie charts go wrong. So you look at it and it's just like, right, well, there's just two, just what's going on? Can someone talk me through it? I don't, just, it, it the, the visualization was the number of deployments done over a particular period of time. And it's things like, well, hang on, Who's the purple? And it's like, well, which shade of purple? <laughs> I can't work it out. You get into the realms of sort of saying, right, well, in fact, I've got a laser pointer there. This kind of yellow wedge here, is that bigger or smaller than this kind of pukey green colour here? <laughs> and likewise, this purple and this purple here, they look pretty much the same. So pie charts, they're just, they're not the greatest. So is it a case of just saying no? Is it like 3D effects, which is like, no, under pain of death, never ever do it? I say, you can use pie charts. I'm sure that will please some people. There are just some golden rules that you absolutely have to, have to follow. So only two data series. Um, let's reference Brexit again. If it's remain and leave, that works in a pie chart. If it's remain, leave, not sure, that doesn't. As soon as you go past two data series, don't use a pie chart. And the biggest slice always starts at 12 o'clock. So in terms of best practices for pie charts, this is perfectly acceptable. <laughs> Absolutely best practice in terms of how to create a pie chart. This, unfortunately, this is my personal favorite data viz. I do, I, I have a personal favorite data viz. But unfortunately, it's bad practice and shouldn't ever be used. Uh, and that is just another really good example of uh, what a good pie chart should look like. Right, this is the last one. This is one of my favorites. Who can tell me what's wrong with this database? He's seen it before. He knows the answer. Uh, he's right. I haven't got a title. So let's give it a title. So off the back of that, hopefully you know where I'm going to go next. I'm going to say, tally visualizations in the form of a question. So this works really well on so many different levels. First of all, just psychologically, it draws you in to look for an answer. If you phrase it as a question, so you may or may not have noticed, but all the example uh, visits that have been included tonight have been phrased with questions. So on the very first slide, when it said, who is the best BI developer? You all went, it's Johnny. Um, <laughs> likewise, uh, I can't think what else was in there. Oh, how, long, how long is Johnny's beard? You were like, right, OK, there we go. That's how long Johnny's beard is. If you phrase it as a question, your end user looks for the answer and gets that meaning really, really quickly. So it works well from that perspective. Um, from the sort of data ink ratio perspective, the other thing that's sort of featured throughout, um, throughout the presentation, I haven't really bothered labeling my axes. Again, it's kind of 
extra ink to bother to describe what the axes are. But phrases a question, it becomes intuitive anyway. So it should just be a case of, well, obviously that's types of question and that's level of effectiveness. So I don't need to label it because my question kind of phrases it in a way that's going to make it intuitive. The other one that works really, really well is if you create a data visualization and you're like, right, Johnny says I need to title this as a question. And then you can't figure out what the question is, then the chances are that your vis doesn't provide an answer and it's just a meaningless piece of measurement. There's a phrase, um, people end up measuring anything that moves and it's, it's not an effective way to, to run a business. You, you put in you're putting stats out there for the sake of putting stats out there as opposed to actually trying to find insight in the numbers. Um, so yeah, it works really, really well from that perspective too. That's my absolute favorite, so it's to the end. Some further reading, because I know you're all going to be going away from this talk as really big data visualization enthusiasts. So uh, Edward Tufty, his website's really good. This guy called Stephen Fuse has written a couple of really good books as well. Uh, his blog, Perceptual Edge, is awesome. That's how you spell Joey Cheddarchuk, if anyone else wants to try and pronounce it. Uh, but Dark Horse Analytics is his company, and his Data Looks Better Naked blog is really good. And then Stephanie Evergreen runs a data visualization uh, consultancy, and there's loads of really, really great resources on her website, too. So pretty much everything you've seen tonight hasn't just been stuff that I've made up. It's stuff that I've gone away and read up on and gotten enthusiastic about, not just uh, me trying to make things up. Anybody got any questions? Nope. Street. Oh, yeah, different. It's going to be available afterwards. Uh, uh, who's, where's the gaffer? Where's, uh, where's Tommy Hodges? Tommy Hodges, who's in charge, says that we will make the slides available afterwards. They're a complete mess, and you'll see the slideshow because I've got loads of animations over the top. But if you can make sense of them, go for it. Feel free to reach out if you want to know anything else. It's johnny.winter.ao.com. Thank you very much for listening. Oh,